Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Doug Brunke. I'm the founder and CEO of Global Chamber. One of the recurring necessary conversations that we have is cross-cultural. It's really kind of the part of the core of why we're involved with global <laughs> business. If we didn't really care about it or be interested in it, we'd be working on a street corner or in a, some city and, and just dealing with the people that we know and the cultures that we know. And that's not so fun or interesting. And, and we'd much rather be with people that are uh, different and and have different cultures and act differently and i will say however it does get frustrating right because you know not everybody is like us we were just talking about time as we started the program and those of us that are uh, germanic you know, and swiss and etc you know, we have a certain concept of time being on time being punctual and there are other cultures um, that don't have that same rigidity uh, around time. And so which one is right? I don't think any of them is right. I think, you know, we're all who we are and respecting and understanding the differences re is really what we try to do in business. Because at the end of the day, Global Chamber set up to grow business. And the way you grow business is you connect with people. So like with Lainey Denslow, who is in the audience, she is the expert on Americans. Like if, if you're a not an American and you want to do business with Americans, why not understand Americans? And the way generally we think that would be a good idea, right? And it, it carries over to every culture. The other aspect of what we're going to talk about today and our speaker, Louisa Drescher, uh, Dr. Louisa Drescher, who's an expert on these issues, cross-cultural issues. And her topic today is one of the ones that is even becoming more important, and that is managing teams that are cross-border, cross-culture. Uh, Post-COVID, there's so much more going on now where we can hire people in Estonia and in whatever country and have a broad-based team that always was the case. Now it's just more prevalent. And so how do you manage that, especially given you talking to someone and very often talking to a group of people and each one of them is receiving what you're saying in a different way. So how do you overcome that? How do you get to be more effective as a leader across borders and across teams that you have? So Louisa, Dr. Louisa Drescher is the president and CEO of Mastering Cultural Differences. She happens to be from Minnesota right now, but she's originally from Brazil. And she's just, you know, had so many fascinating experiences in her life. That's what it takes, right, to do cross-border businesses. You've got to experience it. You've got to probably enjoy it, probably be frustrated for sure uh, at times, but want to learn more. And Dr. Drescher has not only learned more, she's an expert. And so we're going to listen today. Dr. Drescher, Louisa, you are amazing. We really appreciate your expertise. And we really also appreciate you taking the time today to share on this important topic. Thank you so much, Doug. And you know, I appreciate you know the invitation. I'm so happy to be here. Uh, by now, you know, Obviously, you've heard my accent. Sometimes I joke that this, this is my Minnesota nice accent, but, but it's not. This, this accent comes to you via Brazil, where I was born and raised. And I, I think of myself as someone who's very privileged because of all the experiences that I've had. I've, I've had the opportunity to work in, in Ukraine, in Spain, in Japan, in Puerto Rico, Brazil. And I've met and worked with, you know, visiting scholars and scientists from all over the world. And that's why, you know, um, I think of myself as someone who's, uh, yes, I am Brazilian by birth, but I am, I am multicultural by choice. So let me start my slides. If you have any questions, just write them down and I'll be happy to talk to you um, and, you know, I'll have some time at the end. And Lulu or Lulu, I don't know if I'm pronouncing your name correct. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing it. I saw that you're going to Brazil. I'll be happy to chat with you, connect with me on. on yes, um, I already sent you the link, uh, the invite to connect via LinkedIn. Okay, okay. You know, great minds th think alike. So, you know, 
we can schedule a time to chat if you would yeah, like. You know, my name beautifully. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So let me start with the slides. Hopefully, this is going to work. Okay. I talked to you about that. <clears throat> so. <clears throat> I am someone who's deeply passionate about, you know, helping individuals understand and work well across differences. And that's how, why I spent over 20 years, you know, doing research publications and trainings, you know, on this topic. This is also the topic of my book, Mastering Cultural Differences Strategies for Leading a Global Workforce. And this is also, uh, you know, has, influenced what I, how I work with organizations. In addition to working with, you know, organizations to implement effective um, DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. Um, I also help them understand, you know, cultural differences. Uh, because in these organizations, especially in global organizations, the potential for misunderstanding increases exponentially because of language differences, cultural, you know, value orientations, communication styles. So I have, you know, I started, I created the Global Academy where I help, you know, individuals understand significant cultural differences that impact the workplace and help them learn the skills to work effectively across those differences. And the Global Academy is also now a, a, a digital course that can be completed 100% online. This is how we're going to spend our time together. We're going to talk about you know, global teams and then some key principles for working more effectively with global and virtual teams, some challenges of global and virtual teams and how to address them, and tips for increasing the effectiveness of, of global teams. And some final thoughts in um, Q and A, and some you know I would love you know for you to share at the end some of the biggest takeaways from 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 this session. Um, <clears throat> we don't need to talk about that. Let's start with global teams. You know what works and what doesn't work. The advantage of, uh, of global teams are you know the complex mixture of individual personalities, skills, values, and even work styles, they have been made possible by technology. And technology has you know, significantly improved the effectiveness and, and efficiency of global and virtual teams and helped group, groups overcome geographical barriers and enable, enables, you know, technology also helps, you know, you know, enables a seamless communication and, and collaboration. The bottom line is we don't have to be in the same location to collaborate with someone anymore. Uh, last year I delivered um, a, a lecture for students in the master's degree program in aerospace engineering. And the students were in, in, in Aachen, Germany, did a, a, a Similar lecture was a lecture in intercultural communication to students in the uh, at Loma Linda University. Sometimes I have meetings. I'm in Minnesota. Someone is in in New York. The other one is in the Philippines. So technology allows for for this to happen. Some dis disadvantages, you know, in any team, you'll find team members with different communication styles, different attitudes towards time. Doug and I were talking about that at the beginning, uh, different language proficiency levels, as well as team members who will not be comfortable in speaking in front of a group. Clearly, there are many challenges you have to overcome if you want your global team to work in an effective and efficient manner. As you can see, you know, the failure rate can be high. Um, however, when global and virtual teams work, and, and there are steps that you can take to, to, to make them work, they become very productive and innovative. Some key principles you need to understand so your global teams you know, work more effectively. <clears throat> there are many, but I will only, you know, given our time constraints, I'll, I'll only talk about three of them. The number one thing that you need to understand is the notion of cultural relativity. So when considering 
cultural differences. What matters is not the absolute position of either culture on the scale, but rather the relative position of the two cultures. Uh, for any cultural dimension, imagine you know a continuum, and you have uh, countries you know scattered ac across the continuum. Cultural relativity is what determines how people view one another. For example, uh, let us look how individuals view time. Researchers have found that there are two ways of looking at time. There's those who think that time is, is linear and those who think you know, time is, is more flexible. Now imagine two teams. Team one you know, is the, the British and the French and another team is the Indians and the French. Now the British who tend to be more linear than the French think the French are disorganized, chaotic, lack punctuality, take too many tangents and are hard to follow. The Indians who are to the right of, uh, <clears throat> of the French on the continuum. So th they think the French are rigid, inflexible, obsessed with deadlines, unable to adapt. Cultural relativity is key to understanding how team members will interact with one another. Again, <clears throat> when considering cultural differences, what matters is not the position of either culture, but the relative position of the two, two or, or, or how many you know, cultures. As you can see, the French you know, are characterized very differently depending on, on their partners, where their partners sit on the continuum. Another principle is that the skills involved in being an effective communicator vary dramatically from, from one another. And that's because individuals are trained to communicate in, in different ways. And some are low context communicators and others are you know, high context communicators. And for low context communicators and examples will be the United States, a lot of the Anglo-Saxon cultures, individuals are trained to communicate as literally and explicitly as possible. Good communication is all about clarity and precision. Speakers and they explicitly spell out the ideas, provide all the background knowledge and, the, and, and all the details necessary for others to understand the message. Individuals say what they mean and mean what they say. There's no beating around the bush. And the United States is, is the lowest context culture in the world. And with this group as well, uh, the speaker, it's important to remember that this speaker is 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 the one responsible for making sure the message is is understood it is my job to be clear and to ensure you are understanding <clears throat> now low context communicators the example will be examples you know india china japan indonesia latin americans and so forth the messages are often conveyed implicitly, requiring the listener to read between the lines. Uh, good communication is layered and many depend on copious subtext with responsibility for transmission of, of the message shared between the one sending the message and the one receiving it. Individuals communicate their message without saying them in, you know, directly. And the listener has to read between the lines or as the Chinese would say, to read the air. In other words, um, what are the messages are being transmitted beyond the spoken word? Being a good listener is just as important or, or for effective communication as, as being a good speaker. 
And being a good listener is just, uh, for example, when let's say the Chinese express an idea or an opinion, the real message is often just implied. They ask the listener to take active role in deciphering the message and create um, meaning. For them, the message up front is not necessarily the real message. They will drop hints um, and you have to, to pick them up. And it's not necessary. In fact, it is inappropriate to spell out all the messages uh, explicitly. Now, for example, how these two communication styles show up in the world. Let's say, you know, a, a UK meeting, for example. Uh, it's all about clarification, clarification, clarification. That's good business practice. You talk, what are you going to be talk about at the end of the meeting? You know, this is your recap, what it was decided. And then you do another recap, sending a follow-up email. In a French meeting, uh, people know what has been decided, and and they should, you know, and what what who should do what without having, you know, going through all the levels uh, of clarification that people used in the UK. Do you see the differences? So the impact of these two cultural differences, you know, you know, the, here's how you know individuals see each other. Low context communicators, they perceive high context communicators as secretive, as lacking transparency, unable to communicate effectively. If people uh, are not telling you know, like it is, then they are lying. In fact, in the Netherlands, if you don't say it straight, you are not trustworthy. Now let's see now how high context communicators perceive low context communicators. Always stating the obvious, condescending, patronizing and yeah patronize it's highly always you know it's it's inappropriate you know stating the obvious you know you didn't have to repeat all that i understood i heard it in, in the first place and and they think you know individuals are treating them like children in fact i had an argument with my brother who has you know, Brazilians are, you know, high context communicators. And his communicating, communication style is so un-Brazilian, you know, it's just, uh, so we argued. In fact, I'm accusing them of, you know, you need to stop infantilizing people. You don't have to repeat so many times because every conversation that we have, we we'll have a discussion and then, Okay, let's recap. He will recap. This is what we decided. And if it's Zoom, a Zoom conversation, not five minutes after, there will be a, a summary of what was decided. And it wasn't until a couple of weeks ago I interviewed him because I was getting ready for a, a, a podcast. I was being uh, I was going to be a guest in the the Global Gurus podcast which I think is coming live some uh, on the 23rd because I was you know going to share some strategies for working with Brazilians and he worked for either 12 or 15 years in Sao Paulo at, at for multinational corporations and it just it dawned on me that's where he, he picked it up, being, you know, an executive in Sao Paulo, working with U.S. Americans, you know, because he worked with, you know, U.S. companies in Brazil. And that's 
how he developed this 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 com this communication styles, which which is not Brazilian at all. So I, you know, I, I had an argument with him. I have yet to tell him that I now understand why, you know, he communicates the way he does, because I'm sure he doesn't realize that. Here's some strategies for working with high context communication communicators. Practice, you know, listening more carefully and if need, you need it, you know, ask clarifying questions. You need to learn to listen for what is, what is meant instead of what is being said. Uh, you need to reflect more, ask lots of clarifying questions, and pay attention to, to body language as well. You, as I said, read the air, as the Chinese would say. Uh, <clears throat> avoid asking yes or no questions. In many Asian cult uh, cultures, for example, uh, they say no between the lines, you know, and especially if you're speaking to, you know, an, an authority figure, you know, your supervisor or, or, or a, a client. So things like, you know, no comes in many different ways. Sometimes they may say, I'll do my best. I'll think about it. Let me consider it. In all likelihood, these statements mean no. So it's best to ask open, uh, open-ended questions rather than backing the person into the corner uh, that requires a yes or no response. So for example, instead of asking, will the report be ready by 5 p.m. today? You can ask, how difficult would it be for you to deliver the report by 5 p.m. today? So the key is do not put them in a position to say no to you. Uh, never assume the individual is purposefully omitting information or trying to mislead you. Listen more, speak less, and then clarify, you know, when you're not, you know, sure if you understood. You need to focus on the intent of the message and not necessarily what is being said. And just because it's not being directly uh, said directly to you, it does not mean they are deliberately hiding something from you. I was in, in, in Tokyo a couple of years ago uh, at the headquarters of a big US you know, company. And I was having a conversation with one of the managers there, and that was exactly his compa complaint: was that, you know, his his Japanese counterpart was not being upfront, was not not sharing a lot of the information that he was expecting. So they were each, you know, in their own positions. One was expecting everything to be disclosed, shared upfront. And the other one, the Japanese was like, you know, I don't need to tell him everything, he will pick it up. Unfortunately, you know, it, it was obvious to me that he was not, you know, he hadn't been prepared for, for, you know, trained on the cultural differences between the United States and, and, and Japan, which is, you know, really sad. In fact, I read a report years ago that the United States is the country that spends the least on, on, on training in preparing individuals to go overseas. Now, if you are the one sending the message, remember that, that there is less need to repeat yourself. You know, they, they know, no, they know how to listen between the lines. Before repeating yourself, stop talking. Maybe, you know, saying it, you know, once was enough. And also related to that, you need to become more comfortable with silence. The Westerners tend to, 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 to view silent as, you know, as a breakdown in the communication process. We say silent is deadly. So because of that, you know, when there is silence, what do we do? We interject, we jump in, we ask more questions. Sometimes we even answer for the individual. 
So, the, but you know, you need to realize that the, the silent teammate, you know, may be simply translating what was being said or simply formulating an answer, you know, and when he's ready, he's going to give it to you. So be comfortable with silence. Now, <clears throat> is there any, any questions so far? Let me stop with, with, we're doing good on time here. Let me see. Any questions so far? Does anybody have a question or would uh, like to interject? Just uh, open your mic like Lulu has. Good good morning, good afternoon. Uh, morning, morning. Uh, just want to um, add, I'm not, not going to use very low context, context way of communicating, go directly. <laughs> uh, I think uh, living in the UK, I what I picked up is actually the way English people communicate is not necessarily low context. It's actually very high context. So particularly in at workplace and in business meeting, there is quite a, an exclusive you British culture. Everybody um, it's kind of, they call it that you need to read the cues, the social cue. So not not waiting in line, but you need to pick up the cue. So many times people um, don't necessarily pick up the cue. Uh, I always, uh, when in, in my coaching and training, I always say that English people have a very typical line. You say, this is interesting. It can be interpreted in many different ways. And uh, people will think, oh, they, 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 uh, I'm, I'm, you're impressed by what I'm saying, but actually the, what English really mean is actually this is nonsense. So they, they, are quite, they are quite high context in that sense. Yes, I, I've heard about you know the the you know especially as it relates to to humor and sarcasm. Uh, they are on a cat in a category you know yeah. of its own. That that's a great great observation. Thank you, Lainey, Did you did you want to say something? Well, I was thinking that Americans are known for being very low context, very direct. And yet one of the things we're finding in Silicon Valley, as some of the companies, especially young entrepreneurs who come here to pitch, try to get some funding, Americans can be polite and misleading in the way about interesting. We say things, oh, it was fantastic. What, your ideas are just great. And um, one Swiss consultant said, then our young entrepreneurs walk out of a meeting thinking, oh, the check is coming. And it simply means kind of where they heard what you were talking about. So Absolutely. You know, that is so important. And it's all relative. It's all relative. And even within a country, a country, you know, there are great variations, you know, not only by regions, you know, uh, a region like Sao Paulo, for example, in Brazil is very different than, you know, my home state of Minas Gerais. Uh, and there is, you know, there is also the workplace context as well. Uh, and U.S. Americans, you know, if they, they are going to, for example, a supervisor is going to evaluate an employee, they always they do the sandwich method, you know, they say something nice up front, you know, what needs to be improved and so forth. So it's all relative, you know, all, that, that's very, very important. Thank you, Lainey. Let me see if this is gonna work again. <clears throat> okay. Number three, uh, the third principle, you know, what makes a good leader depends, you know, varies a great deal between cultures. Um, some leaders are more, you know, you know, we have, you know, more egalitarian um, groups and more hierarchical groups. The more egalitarian groups, also known as low, low power distance groups, the leader is one of the guys, so to speak, a facilitator among equals, as opposed to someone who, who gives orders. Um, they, their thinking is, I'm not about, above my team. We're all equals. The workplace is more informal. Everyone is on a you know, 
first name basis for the most part in a staff meeting, all voices count, you know, from the intern to the senior director, everyone, you know, has the mic, everyone is welcome to share their thoughts and even expected to share. Leaders have an open door policy and, and they get out of the way so people can get things done. And employees can, can push their leader's idea back, challenge the process. If I don't agree with, with you know, a process or I know, let's have a conversation about it. For more hierarchical groups, for example, employees use titles, they defer to leaders and follow directions, reluctant to, to take initiatives. They always ask for approval or direction. They show deference to those in charge. Leaders in these, you know, in these cultures, they expect to be treated with deference. Oops. Uh, they are seen as individuals who move mountains and motivate, motivate armies. Their role is to care, to teach, to protect. It's almost like a paternalistic role that they assume and ma maintain greater distance um, from the staff. From the, from the staff. I was teaching a, 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 an honors seminar once at Iowa State. And I have both international students and US students. And one US student came in and apologized because she was a bit, a little bit later and she shared with the group that she was at a, at a barbecue. Her boss, you know, cooked some hamburgers and invited the group over. There was a Korean student who was, who shared, you know, she was horrified that the boss actually cooked for the students. Her, her father had a business in, in, in Korea and she said, my father would never do that. Cook for the employees? He would lose respect of the employees if he did that. That you said, do you see the difference? You were supposed to, to maintain the distance. Uh, for more hierarchical groups, all problems are pushed up. You know, the leader makes the fine, final decision. In these societies, symbols play a, a role in defining power. For example, the clothes you wear, you know, the shoes, um, the car you drive, the house, how big a house do you have? Do you have the, so, the supposedly corner office? So there's all symbols that, you know, are gonna, you know, show you are, you know, you are in charge, you are the leader. A level hopping is not appropriate. And this is very, very important. You don't go, for example, to the boss who is a couple of layers above you. You have to follow the hierarchical chain. When my, when I was talking to my brother, he shared, that Brazil is a very, you know, high power distance hierarchical group, more than the United States. Uh, the the CEO came down to talk to me, wanted to talk to him, and he he said he almost had a heart attack. He thought he was going to, you know, to to be fired because you just don't talk to the CEO directly. You go to the to the supervisor above you and then above that and then you eventually get to the CEO. So imagine the following situation. So you know you have an egalitarian boss one and hierarchical boss two. Just let's pretend you are the egalitarian boss one. You are now um you know, you have a, 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 you partner with the hierarchical boss too for, you know, on a software development project. And the hierarchical boss too, you know, is supervising a team of 25 employees. Now, you have a question about the project. So you send an urgent request to employee number one. No response. 
after a couple of days of complete silence, then you try connecting with another employee. Still no response. Now you're really irritated with the lack of response and you call hierarchical boss number two to complain um, about the lack of response. What is going on? Why don't they get back to me? Meanwhile, this guy, the guys here, the employees here are like, why is she contacting us? You know, what are we supposed to do? So the solution for this type of situation is you need to establish a, a, a protocol. It's, this is very important. And then the, the, the hierarchical boss is the one that has to, to needs to communicate the, the protocol. And part of the protocol is, it, has to, it says, you know, the egalitarian boss, it's okay. They can, you know, contact the employees directly, but she would need to copy the boss on it. And when, and they need to know when, when the egalitarian boss, you know, for example, from the United States contacts them, it's okay for them to answer, but also, you know, copy the boss. As long as, you know, the boss knows, you know, then it's okay. But again, they need to understand what's going on and, and a protocol needs to be established up front. So when working with teams in a hierarchical society, you have to, to remember, communicate with the person at your level. You know, get permission to hop from one level to another. Not that you can't, you know, you just have to let them know that that is happening. And if you email someone at a lower hierarchical level, copy the boss. Um, and if you if you need to approach the boss's you know boss or a subordinate 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 get permission from the person in the level in between first and when emailing address the recipient by the last name unless they have indicated otherwise and how do you know that you know just um look at how they they you know, they sign, you know, their email with is it with their last name or the or by their first name. That should be a, a, a clue for you to um on how to address them. It's a couple of years ago I was um, when I worked at the at the law school, I was in communication with the chief justice in in, in Turkey. And I noticed right away the way, he, you know, he signed his letter. He worked, the man had like four, four different titles and all titles were there. So in my correspondence with him, I also used uh, my titles and he, you know, I addressed him, you know, by his title. He always addressed me as, you know, Dr. Louisa. So we needed to 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 observe the protocol because you know I know Turkey is a higher a more hierarchical culture and I knew that was important to him. <clears throat> uh, now let's talk a little bit about some of the challenges of, of global virtual teams and how you can address them. Uh, global virtual teams, these are a group of individuals located in different geographic locations around the world who collaborate and work together on a common project or goal using virtual communication and collaboration tools. Uh, these teams leverage technology to overcome the constraints of physical distance and time zones. Um, <clears throat> In other words, they use, you know, video conferencing, email, instant message, project management so software, and many other online, you know, projects. That's, you know, what makes it possible. So in addition to, to dealing with the cultural differences, some of uh, uh, which the ones I talked about, you know, communication styles, leadership styles, uh, for global virtual teams to be successful, there are other challenges that you need to address as well. For example, logistical challenges and time zones. Um, 
one, you know, possible, you know, solution is to rotate the time for the for the conference calls. This is not just to be nice. It's done so that everyone understand the challenges of late night or early morning meetings. And it's a way of sensitizing all team members to the difficulties of operating globally. When I was interviewing my brother, he shared uh, that one of the things that really irritated the Brazilians was when they had conference calls with the US and the, the, the conference calls invariably were always, you know, take place during the Brazilians' lunchtime. And that infuriated them to no end. Brazilians take lunchtime very seriously. Some companies give employees even two hours for lunch. That's a time for socialize, for socializing, getting to know each other. Plus, you know, the types of meals. Brazilian meals is not like a, a in the US, you know, a common lunch would be a, a quick sandwich. Uh, no, Brazilian meals, you know, Brazilians like rice, beans, salad, meat, which requires a plate and silverware. So he said, you know, they, you know, it was funny to hear him say about how the Brazilians, you know, were irritated because invariably all the meetings took place during their lunchtime. So obviously the U.S. group was not aware, you know, in, uh, or didn't care, or you know, was not you know flexible in a sense to okay, let's change the time. So keep time differences in mind when you schedule conference calls with your overseas partner. That it's very important. Another challenge is language differences. Language is one of the most pro profound hurdles for a, a, a global team. It depends on how proficient all team members are with the language they they they're being used and most often that that is english non-english speakers have to contend with you know the the ability to express the ideas you know clearly and unless they are extremely proficient, expressing thoughts in English will challenge their, their confidence and may limit their contribution. Also, speed of native speakers, as well as the use of jargons, create a barrier to, to understanding. Native speakers do not realize you know, how fast they speak. Then you add to that a lot of jar, you know, jargons that 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 we use. For example, we hit a home run. Um, give me a ballpark figure that came out of the left left field, um, and, and many others. The problem is, unless you grew up with baseball, that means that makes no sense. You know. No, internationals will not understand that. So you have to be aware, not only that you speak fast, but you have to, to avoid using jar jargons because that's not gonna um, help understanding. Um, also, English speakers may have to interpret accents and sometimes difficult to understand pronunciation. Uh, in I, I have a, a, a two-hour communication module as part of my training, and in, in that training, um, we go over a lot of strategies that you know individuals can use when you know working with non-natives in English speakers. Strategies not only as there are things that you can do not only as a listener but also as a speaker. So we spent quite a bit of time, you know, working on that. And very important, watch for the for power in balance. Those who are most comfortable with the language can be more articulate and, and persuasive, and and thus have more power in the group uh, than those who are not. So you always have to pay attention to that. The power in balance. 
The third challenge is the need to develop trust and relationships despite the distance. Research shows that people establish relationships more easily and quickly than they when they see each other. This is complicated by the distance between team members in global virtual teams, as well as the cultural attitudes of members about doing work with, with total strangers. In cultures that put relationships first, the need to communicate through technology, be emails, video conferencing, text, texting, can exacerbate in misunderstanding. For example, US Americans may be seen as rude because of their direct communication style. Asians may be seen as you know, more evasive because of, of, of their more indirect style. And that's interesting because when I started working in the US uh, and, and I started reading you know, emails from my colleagues, the first thought that came to my mind was, God, this is so rude. It's just so direct, straight to the point. Uh, it, it was not my communication you know, style. And, and I, I found that, that, that you know, I was taken aback, but that, the direct style of US Americans. And please know that humor in emails can be mistaken, insulting, um, being sarcastic, you know, it is not gonna work. You know, it can be seen as culturally insensitive and even cruel. Uh, I wrote a two-part article on the use of emoji when e emailing global teams. Um, and the problem with emoji is that they mean different things to different groups. So you really have to pay attention to that. Um, if, I'll, if you would like a copy of the articles, feel free to email me uh, or message me and I'll be happy to send you, you know, a copy of the, of the article. Now, tips for increasing the effectiveness of global teams. General communication tips. Focus on how something is said and, and on what is not being said. Remember that depending on the context, let's say you're working with Asians, the message up front is not necessarily the real message. They will drop hints uh, and, and it is the listener's responsibility to pick them up. And if you're not sure, take the, the responsibility you know, to ask for clarification. Eventually, you'll get better at picking up the subtleties of the message. Procedural tips. So when working with a global team, define team protocols up front. Uh, when do we skip levels? Whom do we copy and when? So this is, has to be established upfront. Don't wait until a problem arises. The best moment to develop the protocols is when the team is forming and, and before miscommunication takes place. And you know, as the group, ask the group to, to come up with the solutions for minimizing misunderstanding. And remember that most misunderstandings can be avoided by defining a clear team culture that everyone agrees and applies. So if you will recall, you know, low context individuals have a tendency to put everything in writing and send a written recap via email with everything that was decided. High context communicators, on the other hand, they have a strong oral tradition. Written doc documentation is considered less necessary. So the tendency to put everything in writing which is a mark of professionalism and transparency in a low context culture, may suggest to high context colleagues that you don't trust them to follow through on their verbal commitments. 
So when asking the group to begin, you know, putting things in right to, to, to putting things in writing, you need to make sure that you lay the groundwork um, first. Start by explaining the cultural differences. This is, this is very, very important because a lot of the times we behave, we don't know why we behave the way we do. It's just like the story of the two young fishes, you know, were swimming and they run into an older fish who says, good morning, boys, you know, warmest, the water is nice today. The water is warm today. And the young one says, what water? So we don't know, you know, there's a saying that, you know, it's hard to read the label when you are inside the box. And I was doing, uh, doing a program for, for Brazilians the other day and, I shared with them, you only learn about your own culture when you step away, when you learn about others. Uh, that's when you start understanding. So we have no understanding of that the culture, our culture is influencing our behavior. So you explain the cultural difference because this way the negative reactions will diminish. You also have to explain to the team why you're putting everything in writing. For example, you can say, you know, my boss requested it and they and then ask for the indulgency. In, in, in a team that has high context and low context individuals, Putting it in writing reduces confusion and saves time for multicultural teams. However, you have to make sure to explain upfront why you are doing it. They need to understand. One of the, 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 the strategies I share with my clients, one of the best ways to work effectively across cultures is you need to understand where the other is coming from why they're behaving the way they do. And then you take steps to mitigate that. So when working with hierarchical teams, ask your team to meet without you in order to brainstorm as a group and then report the group's ideas to you. And that's very important because without the boss, they will feel more comfortable in sharing ideas. So they need to meet without you. When you call the meeting, give, uh, give clear instructions uh, a few days beforehand about how you would like the meeting to work and what questions you plan to ask. Tell them, you know, tell team members you will call on them for, the, for their input. This way they will be prepared and it gives them time to organize their thoughts, especially if they're speaking on a second language. This is very important. If you are the boss, remember, your role is to chair the meeting. They expect that from you. You're not one of the guys. You are the leader. And don't expect people to jump in and randomly randomly without an invitation. Instead, invite people to speak up. Um, even if team members, you know, have prepared well and are ready to share their ideas, they may not volunteer unless you call on them individually. So keep that in mind. Some final thoughts before I open up, you know, for questions and comments. The success of a global team will require navigating through wildly different cultural realities. You need to understand cultural differences to avoid misunderstandings, needless conflict, and possible failure. It is a big mistake to go in assuming that focusing on individual differences and not on cultural differences is enough. If you go into an interaction, uh, especially a cross-cultural interaction, assuming that culture doesn't matter, your default mechanism is to view others through your own cultural lenses. When interacting with someone from another culture, watch more, listen more, speak less. 
explain your own style frequently. Again, you not only you need to understand where they're coming from, but they need to understand where you are coming from. Training goes both ways. Laugh at yourself when the moment arises. And above all, learn to lead in different ways so you can mobilize and motivate your team, your team members to, who have a different cultural orientation than you do. Again, you know, and I can send you a copy of the slides. Um, you have my email, you can take a screenshot of, of, of my information. Now you have my email. I have a, a newsletter, the, the DEI Minute, where I talk about, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion, but also about global diversity. Here's my LinkedIn um, information. You can connect with me. And if you'd like to schedule a free consultation, here's my, my contact information. And I would like to know if you have questions, comments, uh, and your, you know, a biggest, your biggest takeaway from this session. What, what, what are you walking away with? Lainey, let me start with you since I can see you. <laughs> <laughs> Great presentation, really interesting. Reminded me of things I hadn't thought about for a long time. I really appreciate that. And one thing I was thinking about when you were talking about communication in meetings and the difficulty when with different levels of English proficiency and English being a second or third language is, do you have a, a good mechanism that you've identified for a, allowing somebody um, the space to respond. So what I know what happens for me in translating into another language is I understand the question. I have an idea of what I want to say, but it takes me a while to formulate in my head what how to say it in French as opposed to English. How do you have a an idea about how to gracefully allow people in the meeting who for whom English is a second language? to comment on something and still allow them time to do that internal translation? Well, one I, uh, idea that I would suggest, does it have to be um, at that exact moment? That's the problem. At, at the meeting. Uh, if not, well, well, one possibility, share with them ahead of time what you would like to know. This way they will come prepared. Let them know this is the agenda. This is you know what we're going to talk about. Be prepared, and I will call on X, Y, and Z. I would like to hear from you, from this person okay. exactly, so they will come come in prepared to share. Another thing, strategy that I have found that works is uh, have them send you their input in writing, because in second okay. language acquisition writing is easier than speaking so they can take the time and send you their comments in writing so those are two strategies that could work okay thanks you're welcome what what other questions or comments uh do we have lulu did you want to make a comment as well uh, thank you very much uh Luisa, uh, for this presentation i think one takeaway for me is about the relativity because uh, I'm also working in this uh, area as a course cultural intelligence coach. So yeah, so it's a good reminder about the, the relativity. And also, I also um, say the circuit cross-cultural doesn't always mean cross-country, because within one country, okay. uh, you have cross-cultural as well. So it doesn't always mean cross-country. Yeah, thank you very much. I know. Yeah. <laughs> Like there are so many differences in the United States, for example, the right. culture in New York is very different than the culture in Minnesota or the culture in Alabama, Brazil as well as, you know, all, you know so you have to take that in, to, into consideration. Yeah. I, and one thing I had never thought about directly, and I, Lulu, you brought it up, is this idea of um, high context within a low context environment. 
So I think we see some of that in the United States too. And people are surprised by it or don't get it. But I think it's really something worth talking about that we tend to, to miss. So that that part was helpful to hear about today too. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Get... yeah, I can I can well imagine uh the some southern states uh, in the US <laughs> in really high context. <laughs> All y'all come and one one of the the things is expression is oh bless your heart or bless her heart which is a way of saying oh that's just so crazy <laughs> and i see in the comments that you know those of you who would like the article <laughs> if you could email me directly yeah uh that would be easier yeah uh, and well, i yeah. and i can put then I know I'm going to put my email. It's Louisa at Mastering Cultural Differences. Yeah, I, I've got um, it. Great. That sounds like a really fascinating article. I'm excited to see that. Yes, it's, it, you know, we have to be careful, especially, you know, with a younger, you know, audience and in workplaces these days. Um, you know, using emoji in, in correspondence. Um, it works depending on, on the audience, you know, cross-culturally, you have to be very careful. Like, for example, the OK emoji in the United States. Mm -hmm. In Brazil, carries a sexual connotation. So it yeah. will be very, very offensive. Mm -hmm. So you have to understand, you know, these differences. One of the chapters in my book and one of my workshops is solely on nonverbal communication. Because most of what we communicate is done nonverbally. So it's a really important, you know, part of the communication process that we need to pay attention to. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and I, I think what struck me is, well, I think about nonverbal communication being how we smile or how we use our hands, but and it's now emojis too. Yes, and there are many other aspects. You know how we view time, which probably Doug is about to have a heart attack with his, <laughs> oh, his Swiss over. timing, <laughs> and we are five minutes over. But I told him in the beginning in Brazil, you know, a professor will just stay on and on and on. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, unless yeah. he shut down. Yeah. Sure, sure. <laughs> the the nonverbal non communication I actually posted in the post in LinkedIn today. It's not. It's about how the U.S. and the China meeting happened recently. How they set the meeting room carried huge amount of meaning. So it's worth reading if you are interested. I post it today. Yeah, I'll okay, take great. a look I'll at look it. And that, it. that is exactly right. I hosted a Chinese delegation once at, at when I was a, an assistant dean in a law school, and we had. I had to really make sure, and I had to teach everybody who sits where where the flags go, who was the first one to speak, how do you exchange cards, you know, in gifts, all these, you know, uh, symbols, you know, are very, very important. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's a great reminder. All right. <laughs> thank you so much, Louisa. You're was very a great session. Thank uh, you. Lisa, Lisa yes. Cesar here. Yes. yes. Quick question. What's the official lunch time in Brazil? Is it like noon or 1 p.m.? How does that work? Um, I think if I recall it correctly, noon, but it could, okay. could go until two o'clock. Some companies, like okay. I said, give, you know, two hours, you know. Because I, I, you know, just exactly when you were giving the example of the meetings and the lunch time, I was moving our event next week with Brazilian speakers to the lunch time. So I <laughs> I failed on that day. I saved uh, you. Yeah. You owe me you owe me a fungo meal when I go to Puerto Rico. <laughs> yeah I will I will thank you Lisa. Yeah, no do not do not you know, Brazilians take their <laughs> meals very seriously. It's not gonna go well. I, I I laughed when my brother told me that because, you know, and he said once you know it's okay, but every single time, um, yeah, yeah, that's no, not gonna we, go we, well. With them, we try to be something around eleven a.m. before lunch, but this one uh -huh. we have a double book, 
uh, with a more event in Africa, but I asked them first if, I, if it was possible. So okay, and so, it's, yeah, it's more... pos possible they will, you know, you know, make an exception for you. You know, when yeah. in doubt, ask them what would be the best time for them. Exactly. Um, cool. Thank you, Lisa. All right. I'm thank glad. You. Well, thank, thank you, you, Louisa. You're very welcome. Yeah. I loved it. You know, it was connect great. with me and, and send me a message. Okay. I want to know how I missed the, what you said. It's hard to read the label when you're inside the box. I don't know how I've missed that, but I love that. And it's so true, right? It's a lot of the reason why those who travel and do international business have a, actually, I think, a better understanding of their own culture, as you pointed out, than yes. those who are inside the box. So thank you for bringing that up because that's a reinforcement of what we believe. And that is, please, people. Do something global. <laughs> get, get an education. And that's really what it is. You get to read your own label. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.